Well, I'm glad you're here today because we're continuing our series called The Kingdom. Everybody say The Kingdom. The Kingdom. This is the third installment of The Kingdom in this whole series is talking about how when Jesus was here, he preached the gospel of the kingdom of God. You know, most people hear about the gospel of salvation. That's the good news. Everyone say good news of salvation. And that is Jesus Christ died on the cross, paid the price for our sin, so that when we believe in Jesus, the Bible says we are translated, we are transferred out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus is the king. How many are grateful for salvation? Amen. That means you're no longer going to hell, you're on your way to heaven. But when Jesus was here, he didn't just preach about the gospel of salvation, he preached about the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom. And he says, I want you to seek first the kingdom of God. I want you to make it a high priority. Be, above anything else, I want you to seek the kingdom of God and how it operates. And when you do, Jesus says, all these things shall be added unto you. So we're saved through the good news of salvation. But then God has all of these things he wants to add to you. Now, that word things, it doesn't mean TVs and in cars and in homes. And you don't need God to get all those things, okay? You just need a job. And there's people who don't even believe in Jesus that have bigger TVs than I do. Amen. But that's not the things. God says you don't have to worry about anything. You seek my kingdom. You learn to operate in my kingdom. And I will add this thing called life in life more abundantly. It's what comes with the ticket that so many believers don't understand. So all through the Gospels, all through the good news Gospels, Jesus is going around talking to people about the kingdom. That phrase is used like 80 times. And so he's trying to get something across to us. And so today we're going to talk about what I would call the mentality of the kingdom. The mentality of of the kingdom. Now, most of these, if not all of these kingdom principles are completely different than the world's kingdom. The world has its way of thinking, its way of doing, its way of behaving and treating people, its way of thinking. Jesus comes and says, hey, I'm going to tell you the good news of my kingdom. We think differently, we talk differently, we behave differently. In today's message, I don't think there's another message that pertains to the kingdom, that is a more stark contrast to the world's mentality. The, the, this is how we think in the kingdom. In, in the more we adopt this kind of thinking, the more we will live in this life more abundantly. And in fact, what we're talking about today, I believe, unlocks all of the other attributes and the promises and the things that God wants us to experience. I believe the number one quality of Jesus, I don't think anyone could argue with this, and that is God is love. He's love. He's love. If you were to somehow have to list the, the attributes of Christ, love would be at the top. No, no, no question about it. But at a very close second, what we're going to talk about today, this is the mentality of, uh, of the kingdom where Jesus is the king. I believe the second greatest quality of Jesus is this thing called humility. Humility. Now, that's not a popular word, okay? It, 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 humility is not something that people get their hankies out and get ready to shake at the preacher when he preaches on humility. No one feels the rushes of the presence of the Holy Spirit, you want to hear a message about how I can be victorious. Woo! Talk about the authority in the name of Jesus. I am the head and not the tail. And that's great, and you are, but you won't experience any of that unless you learn the mentality of the kingdom, and that is how to humble yourself and have the attitude Christ had. And so let's just hit this thing. I mean, if there is an opposite side of the coin between the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God, it's this thing called humility. So we're going to talk about greatness today. We're going to talk about what it means to be great. And everyone wants to be great. I, I want to be great. And, and what you're going to find, we're going to, 
we're going to read some stories here of Jesus talking to his disciples. And I want you to write this down from the get-go, and then we're, going to, we're just going to unpack this mentality. And, and what you need to understand is there's nothing wrong with being great. You'll never find Jesus, write this down, you'll never find Jesus rebuking the disciples for wanting to be great. But what you will find is Jesus redefining greatness. I want you to ponder that just for a second. You're not going to see Jesus say, hey, that's bad. You don't want to become great. Don't become great. He didn't do that. But what he did was is that he redefined what greatness is. And there's a definition of greatness in the world. And it generally means the best uh, job I can have. Greatness means the more people who follow me and listen to me or the more people I can domineer and dominate. The larger the house, the more the cars, the greater the vacation, the greater the athlete, the greater. We look at greatness as everyone looking to us and and serving us. That's the world's kind of definition. Now here comes a king from a different kingdom, a king that loves you with all of his heart. He comes to this right and smack in the middle of the kingdom of darkness, and he redefines greatness. Everybody say greatness. Okay, turn to your neighbor and say, you are becoming great. Come on, say it like you mean it. Turn to somebody else and say, you are becoming great. All right, so in Matthew chapter 20, Matthew chapter 20, it's interesting, you know, he's with his disciples, and we know this scenario that uh, one of the moms was there, uh, a mother of two of the disciples. And so she comes up to Jesus and and I can just kind of picture her saying, hey, Jesus, psh, hey, come on, come over here. It's the attention of Jesus. And I can just see this mama just putting her arm around Jesus and just kind of taking Jesus over to the side. Hey, Jesus, listen, man, you're, you're becoming great. I mean, the mir- all those people, these miracles and the crowds. And so this mama, she is picking up on the, the product, projectile of fame that Jesus is on. And so what is a mama? Mama loves her sons. So mama says, hey, Jesus, Jesus, hey, I got two sons here. Hey, can you, can you put one on your left side and one on your right side? Because I want them to be important with you. I want them to be, have the greatest seats of importance. And I'm sure Jesus just kind of shake his head. Oh, what a precious mama. And he says, you know, uh, I'm not sure if they're ready for that. And now here comes the sons. The sons are like, hey, yeah, I think we could do that. And then the rest of the disciples kind of see what's going on. Now they start getting upset because they're like, oh, man, they got, the mama's trying to get them in the seat. We want, that we want to be that important person. We want to have those seats. And now, so all the disciples are now arguing and getting upset. And the Bible says they're getting disappointed and angry at the two sons of, of the mother. And so now, here's Jesus looking around. They all vying for the seat of, 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 of importance. And he's like, okay, okay, let's just hold up right here. In Matthew 20, verse 24, we'll pick it up there. It says, and when the ten heard it, uh, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. Uh, but n- notice they were displeased with the two brothers because they know they ain't got nothing on that mama. You ain't talking bad about the mama, okay? <laughs> and so we're just going to shift to the, to the brothers. And uh, they're getting all upset. And so Jesus called to himself. I can just imagine, say, okay, guys, staff meeting. Come on, come on. Small group meeting. Let, let, let's hit this thing because this is actually stirring up something that is vital in the kingdom. And he begins to describe uh, the situation, capitalize on it to to make it a teaching point. He says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. That word lord is more of like a dictator, domineering, lord it over them. And those who are great exercise authority over them. What's he doing? He's just kind of stating greatness from the world's perspective. They lord it over you. They exercise that authority over you. They got the big chariots. They use whips. They dictate. They domineer. And they, what he's saying is that that's how you see greatness in the world. But look what it says in verse 26. Yet it shall not. Everybody say, shall not. It shall not be so among you. 
That, that's the way it is, and, and I know that's what you grew up with, but that's not how it is in my kingdom. He says, whoever desires to become great, everybody say great. Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And among you, let him be as your slave or bond servant. So I know this is what you see as greatness. And I know that's what you think you're going to get if you stand next to me. But in my kingdom, it's the opposite. In my kingdom, the greatest are not the ones who lord it over people and dictate over people, make people serve them. The greatest in my kingdom, and if you want to be great, then you need to become the servant. What's he doing? He's redefining greatness. And what's great about the kingdom, it doesn't matter your education, it doesn't matter what kind of job or what side of the tracks you were born on, or the color of your skin, it doesn't matter. There's no qualifications in race or education. Anyone who adopts the kingdom mentality and lowers him or herself and becomes a servant in God's kingdom, they'll become great. Amen. Come on now. How many want to become great? Let me see your hands. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. Raise your hand. If you want to become great, Raise your hand. It's okay. Some of y'all are like, well, I don't know. Okay, I want to be humble. This is great. That's how you get great. Amen. Come on now. I don't know about you, but I want to be great in God's eyes. And so the great thing about Jesus is, is all through the scriptures, he doesn't just declare it, he demonstrates it. And so he kind of he kind of nails it, it, it through, hit the, hit the nail on the head in verse 28. He goes, just as... The Son of Man, that, that's Jesus, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, riding in the big chariot, flaunting authority, harshly lording over people, uh -huh. but I came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, the disciples, Jesus continually says things that the disciples probably nodded their head, but they didn't get that. No idea of knowing what that meant. We do. We look back at the story. What is Jesus saying is that even though I had all the authority and I have anybody could lord it over, I'm not just telling you to become servants so that you can become great. I'm showing you. I'm actually come not to be served, but to serve, and you're going to see it. You don't know now, but you're going to see it. I'm actually going to lay my life down to pay a price I don't owe. Mm -hmm. Come on, come on. And to serve to the point of death on a cross. I don't think anyone would argue the point that Jesus is the greatest man who's ever lived and sits at the highest throne of authority. And he did it the kingdom way. He comes and he serves. He said, well, how did he serve? He's serving the bread of life. He, he's teaching them about the kingdom. He doesn't have to hear any of it. He knows it all anyway. He's not there for anything for him. It doesn't do him any good. He's there for us to serve us, to, to lay his life down as a ransom. What is he doing? He's redefining greatness. Here is what Jesus is saying. If you want to be great, go low. If you want to be great, go low. Look for ways to lay down your life and to serve. It's a mentality. It's, it's a heart condition. It's not just one time, oh, okay, okay, I'll pick up the chairs, okay, I'll, I'll serve. No, 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 it's just a mentality and the more the more this mentality grows in you, the more you think like the king, the more you experience the kingdom. And so Paul, we know he writes all these letters, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he writes these letters to the Philippians and the Colossians and the Ephesians. And what he's doing, he's, doing, he's trying to get across the, the, the kingdom. He's trying to get across what Jesus was preaching about when he was here. So he writes to the Philippians in chapter 2, in verse 5. He says, let this same attitude and purpose and humble mind, everybody say humble, 
be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Let, let Jesus be the example in humility. And here's the example. Who although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, meaning he was possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God God, look what he did. He did not think this equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained. He's one with God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. But what he decided to do, instead of retaining it, instead of grasping it, instead of walking in that, look what he did. He stripped himself of all the privileges and rightful dignity so as to assume the guise of a servant in that he became like men and was born a human being and after he had appeared in human form, he abased or he humbled himself. Everybody say humble. humble. He humbled himself still even further and carried his obedience to the extreme death. Not only just a normal death, but a death on the cross. This is the mentality of the kingdom. And the mentality of this kingdom is when I get the great job, when I'm the doctor, or when I have my own business, everywhere I go, I just expect everybody to bow to me and everybody to, to serve me and, and give me the best seat in the house and, and give me the parking spot. And, and, well, I don't need to do that. You know, I, I'm above that. That's the mentality here. Now, here we got the King of kings and the Lord of lords. No one greater. No one stronger. No one brighter. And he has this attitude that when I come, I'm going to go low. And I'm going to see how I can serve. Now look at the result of this kingdom mentality. Verse 9. Therefore. Everybody say therefore. therefore. Because he stooped so low. Because he stooped so low. God has highly exalted him. And has freely bestowed on him the name that is above every name. That at this name, every knee will bow, every tongue confess. Because he stooped so low. You know, I'm six foot seven. And if I go from this height down to my knees, that stooping lower than somebody who is this high and stoops low. I go farther. I'm not talking about humility right now. Come on. I'm just talking about physically going lower. lower. The higher you are and the lower you go, the distance between the two is the measure of humility. And he's saying, I'm the highest. I'm the greatest. We all know this. But he stooped lower than any other man. He was higher than any other man. In any other being, his name's higher than any other man or any other being. And he stooped low. He allowed those he created to crucify him brutally on a cross to pay for a price they owed. This is the kingdom mentality. And what he's trying to get across is this. How low you go determines how great you become. How much you strip off determines how much God puts on. How low you go in this humility, this mindset that I've come to serve, that I'm here and be willing to do whatever, the, the idea that I esteem, Paul puts it this way, esteem others higher than yourself. Okay, don't, don't, don't just think of yourself as important, but think of them as more important. And when you think of others as more important, even if they have a different skin color, even if they're from a different nation, even if they're from a different side of the tracks, it doesn't matter. There's no qualifications there. When you have the mentality of Christ, even though he was the highest and the most important, that mentality brought him to his knees and began to serve those lesser and less, and less significant around him because he understands this is how the kingdom operates. The seat of greatness is achieved no other way. So Jesus didn't say it's wrong to 
to want to be great, what he's saying is let's, let's just redefine greatness. And let's look at this kingdom perspective. That when you adopt this mentality, and it's a lifelong journey of developing humility in your heart. Every one of us, can I just be honest, every one of us think we humble. We all, are you humble? You know, I'm humble. humble. You know, when we talk about humility, we kind of lower our voice. I'm humble. I'm humble. Some of you are real proud of how humble you are. Let me just, let, so you drive onto the property here to church. You drive on the property, you got your nice car, you know, you drive on, and you found out that they parallel park over here. And it's like right by the, right by the door. And, and so you're like, hey, you know what? I'm going to parallel park right here. Whoo, look at me, front row. But then one of the parking lot dudes come out there and say, hey, you know, this is first service. And if we parallel park here, it's kind of hard between services to get cars in and out. So, so could you go park back there somewhere? Well, <laughs> don't you know who I am? Can you not see the Mercedes Benz label on my car that I'm leasing and my kids can't eat any food because of it, but I got it. You know, in today's day, anybody can drive one of the Mercs, you know that. Kids ain't going to college, though, you know. You live in a shack, you know, we, we kind of live out in the country, and it's funny, sometimes we drive, and we end up, we what people call the boondocks, right? We end the boondocks, and then you see this small little house, and you see the Beamer sitting right out front. <laughs> so you get in your car, oh, okay, what, 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 what are you saying? Hey, hey, don't you know I'm important? What do you, what do you mean, me, move my car? And then you, then you come into the sanctuary. And uh, you want to sit wherever you want to. And you think you're important enough to sit wherever you want to. But, but the ushers, they know they've been trained. I've personally asked them, can you usher people up forward? Because when we're together, there's a shared energy. Right. We're a family. There shouldn't be anybody sitting alone in this church. Amen? That's right. Now, those sitting in the back, they're all convicted. You know, they, <laughs> There's no condemnation. Just next week, come sit up closer. Or the opposite, someone who comes and they were a deacon in the church before. And when they were a deacon in the church before, they sat up here. In, 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 in fact, they sat up here on stage. <laughs> you know, have you ever been there and they got these big old thrones up on the stage? And after worship, the guys come out and they, they prayed after worship. Here comes the man of God. <laughs> and he sits on his throne that's elevated four feet above everybody else. I don't know. I don't see that in the Word. I was talking to a man after the, after the men's breakfast. He said, you know what I appreciate about this place? Is this nothing like the church I went to? He says, I couldn't, be, I couldn't come 20 feet close to the pastor of the church. I don't know. When, when we started this church, I, I, I just looked at Christ and how he did it. I, people say, well, don't touch the anointing. Well, what's the anointing for? I don't see Jesus doing that. I don't, I don't I mean, I'm not coming to, well, maybe I am. Uh, anyway, <laughs> the least significant people in, in, in the town, they start trying to come to Jesus, and the disciples have the world's mentality. Uh-uh, whoa, kids, whoa, 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 don't touch the anointing. Whoa, kids, now you're not important enough. What did Jesus do? Hey, 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 bring them, bring them. In fact, these are the greatest ones in the kingdom. So the disciples were having to learn. And so this mentality, it, it, it bows our heart. It's, 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 uh, it's a mentality that preps us to living in all the kingdom. And, and everyone comes from different cultures. You know, you got people that come and, 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 and they're, they're used to the way other churches doing it. Or however, and and they, here we, we try to have a kingdom culture at this church. And it has happened at times that people who are important in their last church come into this church, and, and they want to skip the whole, you know, just serving thing, and they want to just kind of start there. And, and do, I, I really don't know you. I said, here's the pathway 
for God to promote you. Why don't you join a help team and just begin to serve? One of two things happen. One, they leave and find another church with a smaller mentality leader that is so hungry for some kind of talent to think that that's going to grow their church. I'm not caring about the growing of the church. I'm growing about the individual. Amen. Amen. One time someone said, well, where's the pastor park? Where's, I was looking around. Where's the pastor? Pastor, pastor got a parking spot. I said, yeah, I've got one. I said, come over here. And I walked him out to this back door here. And I looked out, and I, and I said, you see all those cars out there? Yeah. And he's looking. Where's the pastor's parking spot? I said, you see that car way back there? He says, you mean that one there? I said, I said no, not, not the one on the pavement. The one on the, the dirt back there. In the, 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 just look, the farthest one. You see that one? He goes, yeah. And he's thinking, you know, that's the, that's the, that's the usher. And I said, um, that's my car. What was I doing? You know, we don't do it that way here. Amen. You know, if you're a leader in this church, you're the ones that park the farthest way. In fact, if you're a leader, you have a spare set of tennis shoes in your car so you can put them on and walk to the church and then put your fancy ones on. <laughs> Jesus is redefining greatness. Jesus is trying to get across, Matthew 23, 11, but he who is the greatest among you shall be your servant. I've had several people through the years, rich people, business people, and it doesn't take them long to find out that I'm not impressed with the car you drive, and I don't think God is either. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. Drive the car. You and God, you choose what car. I'm not, but I'm not impressed, and your money doesn't influence me. Amen. You know who I'm impressed with? I'm impressed with someone like a, a Donna Racer young lady in our church that serves on multiple help teams. Comes to the, to the equipped classes, comes to prayer. Donnie's Tollerson. She just emulates this mentality. Hey, is there anything I can do? She's on the prayer team. She's on the resource team. She serves at every outreach. She's at prayer. She, hey, is there anything I need to do? Any, anything I do? Wait, she's got this heart. Can I tell you something? That's what impresses me. And that's what I think God looks down and says, there's one of the great ones. Even at the Last Supper, the last things that Jesus is trying to get across, the disciples start arguing amongst themselves again. And, and, and he's been with them for three years. And he's like, okay, guys, let's go over this again. In Luke 22, in verse 25, and he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship. They master over them. And those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. And benefactors means a doer of good in, in, in the eyes of the world. Look, they're doing good. And he says, hey, guys, listen, let me just go through this again. But not so among you. This is not how we do it. But on the contrary, who is greatest among you, let him be the younger. And he who governs, let him be the one who serves. For he who is greater, he, he asked him this question. We're going to close with this. He said, who's greater? Verse 27. He who sits at the table or he, he who serves? And he says, isn't the one that sits at the table? I mean, I just ask you the question. If someone's sitting at the table and there's a bunch of people running around serving him, what are he saying? This is the kingdom or the uh, world's mentality. Who, who would be greater? And, and, and everybody would be answering, well, it's the one sitting at the table. I mean, dude, he's the important one because he's sitting at the table and everybody running around. Look what he says. So profound. Yet I am among you as the one who serves. And later on, the Bible says that he knew he was from God and going to God. He knew that God had given him all things. And with that knowledge, he gets up from the table and he washes the feet of the disciples. I think this is what he's trying to get across. This is the Last Supper he knew that in order to build his kingdom, it would have to be built on humility. He knew that when these disciples start walking in his power, there are going to be people that are going to praise them. There's going to be people that are going to elevate them. There's going to be people that call them great. In fact, there's a time in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, that they called them gods. 
And Jesus knew if we're going to get anywhere with building my kingdom, I just started the thing. I'm the cornerstone, but I need other people that would build my kingdom, that will preach the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus knew, that's why he did it at the Last Supper, that it's only going to be built successfully on this mentality called humility in a servant's heart. So he's trying to get it across, and he's saying, listen, I'm on my knees. I'm washing your feet. I'm serving you. Washing feet was the lowest job of a servant. He didn't just get up and fill their water and fill their wine and say, hey, can I take your dirty dishes? That would be enough. But he didn't do that. He went the lowest a servant would go, and he washes their dirty feet. He's thinking about the kingdom. He's thinking about establishing this thing called Jesus, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. And he says, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. You know, this kind of teaching is, you can't really teach it. It really can't be taught. It's got to be caught. There's one thing we all have in common, no matter where you're at in the level of humility, including myself, listen, we all have this one thing in common. We all have a long way to go. As I draw closer to God and as the ministry grows, one of the things that become more most apparent, one of the biggest revelations I get is how far I have yet to go. I spend more time on my, my knees now than ever before in my life. And I'm just wondering how many people's hearts right now are saying, I want to be great, so I'm going to go low. I wonder if you would say yes to this mentality to be a part of this church, because you look around, look, at there's some empty seats in the house this morning. There's some empty seats. But God doesn't want any empty seats in his house. And so he's looking into the hearts of those who are already here to determine if he's going to put his hand on it to send more. Let me say it again. Jesus looks down into the hearts of the people already there to see if he finds the mentality that he can trust so that he can send more. I want you to just close your eyes for a moment. We just have a few minutes this morning. I know you might feel awkward and it might get you out of your comfort zone. But I just wonder if, if there are some people here that would join me to just kick start a new level of humility in their lives. To say, I want to become great in God's eyes. That would be willing to just go to their knees. Literally, physically go to their knees at their seat. And say, God, will you kickstart humility in my life? I want you to join me. I invite you to just turn around in your chairs right now. You say, well, what will people think? I don't know. I'm glad Jesus didn't think that when he was getting nailed to the cross. The one thing God's reminded me recently is, Jeff, my people don't spend enough time on their knees. We sing about Jesus coming. We sing about welcome Holy Spirit. But if Jesus the King would literally walk into the room, the subjects would bow. And I believe bowing before the Lord, of course it's bowing in your heart, but there's something about doing the physical bowing that the heart follows. Father, we bow before you. Jesus, King, we bow before you. Jesus, will you forgive us for thinking highly of ourselves? Will you forgive us for having the mentality of the, of the world instead of the mentality of the kingdom? You know, when we bow before the Lord, the Holy Spirit comes and begins to point out pride, point out 
arrogance point out the thoughts of um, higher and more important than others. Just allow the Holy Spirit to do that right now. Holy Spirit, we give you free access to our hearts. And Jesus, we, we, we want to become great. We do. We, we don't want to live a, an insignificant life. We don't want to lose in life. We want to win. But we want to win in your kingdom, God. So we bow in reverence and in humility to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we ask you to do a work in our hearts. God, mold us and shape us. God, put us on the potter's wheel. Put your hand on our hearts and on our lives. And begin to fill out the stony areas. Begin to find where we elevate ourselves. And with your loving, grace-filled hands, we give you permission to take that pride. Take the pride, God. Take the arrogance, take the pride, and mold us and shape us and give us a grace to go low so you can exalt us high in your kingdom. For it's this atmosphere, it's this mentality where the presence of God is honored, where the king is esteemed, where he comes not just for a visitation, but for a habitation. Where in this house the hearts are bowed in reverence. and Where the fear of God is top priority. The Holy Spirit looks inside not only the hearts but the house. And he says I can dwell there. Because I'm honored. I'm respected. And when the Holy Spirit habitates. People come in one way they leave another. People come in with sicknesses and diseases. And they're healed supernaturally. People come in with addictions and they're set free in the name of Jesus. So, Father, I'm asking you, give us grace to bow. Give us grace to humble ourselves so we don't have to be humbled and do a work in their lives. For some of you, your greatest prayer request is just now began to be answered. Some of you, your loudest heart cry is just begun to be answered as you humble yourself under the hand of God. So Father, I just pray a blessing over every person here. And as we go here today, Father, maybe there's someone here that just needs extra prayer. They just want someone to lay a hand on their shoulder to pray for that sickness or that disease or, or pray for the marriage or Maybe their heart's just burning right now and they just want someone to pray that God will give them grace to humble themselves even more because they want to be great. They want to be great in your kingdom. Then, Lord, as we dismiss, I just pray that they'll come forward and just spend some time with one of the prayer team members so that you can even do a deeper work. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.